Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Canadian Immigration Institute's Express Entry Live Q&A. My name is Mark Holthy. I'm a Canadian immigration lawyer, and this is the opportunity for you to get your Canadian immigration questions answered with a particular focus on Express Entry. So we are super, super grateful for all of the support that all of you guys have given us over the last, what is it, like five years we've been doing this. And um, I'm in my new little, <clears throat> my new little operation here. I hopefully you guys can hear me okay. Uh, we'll see how the audio is. Um, it's always a little bit challenging. I've got a, a neat little mic set up here, <laughs> but I like to keep it kind of hidden. And when you try to do that, then sometimes the uh, the audio isn't picked up quite as well. But that's okay. We are back and we're ready for another go round. And please, as always. Uh, post where you're tuning in from. I love to hear where in this wonderful world you guys are following. And uh, as always, there is an amazing, amazing uh, one hour ahead of us here. And uh, so yeah, start firing off your questions. So I was away for a little bit. We've got uh, Fernando here who's tuning in from Manitoba. Hello, Fernando. Good to see you. And uh, let's see who else we've got here. Uh, Monsoon says that he liked the drip, which we also posted that. So that's cool. Thanks. I try to make things a little interesting. At least that's the attempt. So I'm recording here from my new office and uh, it's got a little bit of a different theme behind me, but it's still, um, yeah, I just needed a little bit of a change. I still do for my home office, but I've got an office down here in Lethbridge and we've got an office in Calgary now too. So um, I'm going through a little bit of a battle with Google because they didn't like the fact that I changed my address in our Google reviews from Lethbridge to Calgary where most of our employees are. And, um, and they, uh, what did they do? They delisted or suspended our business profile. Oh, so if you're trying to find the firm, you definitely have to go directly to holthylaw.com. Otherwise, you are not going to be able to find our law firm website. So holthylaw.com is the, is the law firm website. And we are working on making it findable once again. So um, yeah, boy. There's no end to the fun and excitement of trying to maintain an online presence, is there? But we do what we can. All right, let's see who else we've got tuning in here. Um, Mansoor says, is it true that parents on super visas can work as well? No, they cannot work on super visas. The super visa is purely to visit. And if they work, it is unauthorized and they can be removed from Canada. So that's a clear no, a clear no, Monsoon. Okay, let's see who else we've got here. Uh, Hussam is over in Tunisia. Hello, thanks for tuning in. Um, Fernando says, well, it is snowing in Mojito today. Oh, I am sorry. It's actually, what's the temperature today? Let's take a peek here and let's see. So today in our fine, fine city of Lethbridge, we have, well, it is a little bit cold and there is forecast for it looks like there's a little bit of forecast today. You guys can see this here. Oh, there we go. <laughs> that is, uh, maybe that's a little bit better. You can see Lethbridge. Interesting. I thought it would be able to, it's got a little bit, little bit of a glare there on here. So anyways, you guys can see. One degrees is what we've got uh, in Lethbridge with a chance of flurry. So you are not going to be alone, Fernando. All right, let's see who else we've got tuning in today and we will jump on and I'll get a bunch get a bunch of questions shout out to you guys right away. Okay, and one thing I want to put here. So if you are on another platform like Facebook, I get questions like this. Peter, you my friend are going to have to shrink that question down because there's no way I can get through that in the course of this broadcast. But thanks for connecting in on Facebook. Just shrink it down and then we can connect. All right, Mario is over in Southern California. Welcome, Mario. Great to have you here. David is over in Toronto. Hope the weather's treating you well. Tough loss for the Leafs. Boy, they got worked. They got worked. But hey, at least they made the playoffs. My Flames did not, and I am very, very sad. And the Oilers lost in overtime. So not good for Alberta, indeed. Okay, um, let's see. Lots of people are asking questions about the strike. So what is my opinion about the immigration strike? And you can see here, Joyful Journey says, will the strike affect PNP processing times? It is absolutely likely that the strike will 
absolutely 100% affect post processing times. Unless they resolve it quickly and the officers that are processing those applications are on strike, well, it is going to impact processing times. They're going to go up. And so it doesn't matter, like ultimately when it comes to filing your applications, you're still going to keep doing what you need to do. And hopefully they can resolve it quickly. But, um, but yeah, this is, it's really hard. It's really difficult because through the pandemic, you know, there was a lot of really, really difficult situations. But many of the public servants, and this is part of the problem, many of them um, were still paid full-time wages during the pandemic when things were locked down. So when many people were not receiving um, income because they were, you know, laid off in their work or their employment, you know, they weren't getting paid at all. But many of those workers were home that and were getting still getting their full-time paychecks. And so I believe that everybody with the cost of living going up and our government's played a big role in that, but with the cost of living going up, everybody needs to be able to make a living and to be able to afford food and a house and all those kinds of things. So I don't fault them for, uh, you know, for taking whatever labor action they need to, to give them the best um, opportunities to provide for their families. Um, but at the same time, I sure hope they can resolve this quick because it is definitely going to impact processing times, you guys. Anyone who thinks it doesn't is, is really misguided. All right, Mike says, hey, Mark, watching here from Saudi Arabia, the good old SA. Good to see you here. Thanks for connecting in. Um, Mario says that he is, uh, he's been following the videos. Uh, he, he's not been following the videos lately. Super busy at work. I was wondering if there were any news on the brand new powers Minister Fraser would enjoy starting spring. Well, the reality, Mario, is that the minister now appears to have backed off from his statement before that he was going to be doing the strategic draws starting in the spring of 2023. In fact, it looks like it's probably going to be more likely the latter part of the year. So maybe we're into July. That's entirely possible. Spring goes all the way until what, June 22nd, 23rd. And so it could be anywhere in probably the latter half of the year. And we've seen those big draws. The most recent draw, as everybody for sure has been following this with keen attention, at least those on the live Q&A, you can see last week, April the 12th, when I was away, so I was off in the mountains enjoying some time with family, um, that, uh, that draw was a little bit lower than the previous ones at 3,500. And obviously it caused the scores to go up a little bit, 486. So that was what we saw last week and on April the 12th. And, um, you know, I think it's unlikely that we'll see another draw today, but who knows? Like, it, it's just a mystery no matter what direction. Um, I don't think anybody has a real clear idea what the minister's doing. All right. So there's a little update for you, Mario. Okay. Um, uh, Suki says, hey, Mark, thanks for your great videos. I recently received, oh, I see this. Let's do give him one of these. <laughs> there we go. He said, I recently received an ITA. I have a sister who's a PR, but she hasn't gotten her PR card yet. Will her confirmation of PR be okay as proof of PR? Well, that is proof of her permanent residence is her confirmation of permanent residence, not receiving her PR card. So um, you can indeed, you can include that as evidence um, and then make sure you've got all the other evidence to show that she actually lives, excuse me, in, in, uh, in Canada. Okay. Oh, Amitage says, hey, got my PR approval yesterday. Thank you for your guidance. Oh, I love hearing that. That's fantastic. Okay, we better give Amitage a little bit of a, a celebration as well. Great, great news. Absolutely love to hear that, my friend. All right, let's see here. We're going to zip through, do a couple more shout outs. Uh, bonjour, uh, Gosai uh, Pratique. Bonjour to you. And okay, let's see, Peter. Okay, it's a little bit smaller. We'll see if we can tackle Peter. So he says, I had to withdraw my CEC application because I was not eligible, okay, at the time of ITA and got an ITA for CEC instead of FSW and error due to a glitch last November. I'm now eligible for both with a CRS score of 500 plus. Can I create a new profile um, and get a new invitation or do I have to wait for IRCC to process my withdrawal request first? What if I end up having two applications for the same program? It's been a month now, still no process. Yes. And understand, I've seen those withdrawals. I've seen problems like that happen all the time with people. Um, you know, ultimately, Peter, you won't be able to create a new profile. You can try in your secure account in your same GC key if they have not withdrawn and canceled the other one. So what some people do is they create a new GC key, which is 
Not an option that's really great, but if you do want to initiate the process again while you're waiting for the other one to be withdrawn, it would probably need you to create a new GC key through your IRCC secure account and then start a new profile that way. But whatever you do, Peter, Peter, make sure that you fully disclose the previous application and everything in the new, um, you know, the new EAPR when you get your ITA again. And I also want to let everybody know and shout out, and hopefully some of my students are watching this live, but we are right in the midst of our Canadian Immigration Institute Express Entry Master Class. And so um, the April 17th through the 20th, we're in day three today, this evening, and it has been just a phenomenal group. So big shout out to all of those that are attending the master class. And the cool thing about my new system is that if you have paid for a course in the past, you have received an invitation to join in the master classes during this week. And we'll see how long we ultimately roll that out. But uh, there is still time if you want to jump in and subscribe to the course and join us tonight, 4 to 5 p.m. is when we do it. Then at that stage, um, if you uh, didn't get all your questions answered, when we do another masterclass, probably in about a month or so, you can join in there and finish off the loose ends. But the sooner you register for the course, the better, because then you have an opportunity to go through the over 10 hours of content, you guys. There is over 10 hours of content. It's all broken down here on the page. Um, and then coupled with the four hours of live masterclasses with yours truly covers off every aspect of Express Entry, um, no matter how challenging the questions are. And it's all available for life. The recordings, even with the live streams that we do um, within the masterclass, they're all recorded and available to watch after. And if you can't make it between 4 and 5 p.m., no worries. You can always post your questions in the community group, and then I make sure that I answer them for the next uh, the next live stream. So there you go. All right, Peter, we were able to get to you over there on Facebook. Great that you're connecting in. Okay, Mario, you're very welcome. Okay, Ali's got a super chat. Ali says that he's on implied status until April 30th. Received an email from IRCC for 18 months yesterday. Submitted another new work permit application 18 months. Am I legally allowed to work past April 30th if the decision comes later? If you do, as you've indicated here, and you've actually submitted another new work permit application before your current one expires, which is April the 30th, today's April the 19th. So if those things hold true and you've done it properly, if submitted correctly, then you can continue to work under maintained status. Um, always, always, Ali, when I talk to people <clears throat> about specific questions, there may be other factors, there may be other, you know, things that you haven't told me or disclosed that change you know, the, the, um, the answer that I have to your question. So I always strongly encourage people to slide over to our website and just click on speak to a lawyer and connect right away with Alicia, Cedric, or myself. And um, yes, we'd love to, to help you in any way possible. And within the context of this live stream, clearly it's not, uh, I'm not able to answer everybody's questions when they're super specific. Okay. Um, Lil says, I'm so excited to attend the Canada program today. It is great to have you here. Let's see. Is there anyone else? Please post where you're tuning in from. I love to hear and see where people are connecting in from so that we can dive in and get your questions answered. Now, like I said last week, I had a little bit of a break. I took the week off, so we didn't do a live stream. But this week, um, we're back at it again. Alicia will be joining me tomorrow, and we'll be doing another round of uh, live Canada immigration Q and A's. Okay, let's see if we have anyone else here. Um, let's see. Let's see if I have all the questions. So I want to make sure I'm not missing any. Do, 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 do. Let's see. Um, okay, Hussam says uh, hello, Mark and Alicia. Well, Alicia is going to be joining me tomorrow. She's not here with me today. I applied online for my French PCC, but it does not include any information about my period of stay. Could this be an issue for the immigration officer? Not all countries include that information. Many countries only include a complete search of any record that relates to you and your particular biographical, biographical information. You know, and so most countries actually don't have, um, you know, dates on them. So it's not normally an issue, um, but it depends upon the country. 
Okay, let's see here. Uh, let's see what's next. <clears throat> Natalia says, after AOR, I applied to the bridging open work permit and I got a letter with only 11 days of extension. Original work permit expires July 30th and they extended it until August the 11th. What should I expect next for the actual work permit? Not a clue. I don't know why they would only issue it until August 11th. Um, I guess it depends on when you submitted your, your bridging open work permit. Um, but you said you have, you received the letter with only 11 days of extension. Well, understand Natalia that that letter means nothing. So that letter is purely for the purposes of satisfying some other third party, but your ability to continue working under implied status or maintain status as they call it now through the submission of your bridging open work permit. If you held, remember now, if you held a valid work permit at the time in which you submitted the bridging open work permit, or you were eligible through one of the other parameters of to restore, um, then, uh, then you can continue to maintain uh, your stat. Well, let me, let me take a step back. This is where I have to be very careful. Maintain status only exists if you've submitted that bridging open work permit application before your current work permit expired. If you submitted the bridging open work permit after your past work permit expired, then you can't work. So um, you can't work until you actually get the work permit approved. So yes. So as, but as far as that letter, you can request an extension. There's a process online where you can go through. And if you want to book a consult, Natalia, we can walk through that process and we can discuss it. But essentially, if you go online, you can see a, a section where it gives you instruction on how to request through um, basically a web form, an extension or a letter, um, a new letter, an updated letter, I should say, uh, that uh, that you can have in your possession to say yes, Natalia is uh, you know uh, continue continues to have status in whatever capacity. Okay, all right. Let's see what's next on our list here. Uh, da, da, da. Let's see here. And if I don't get your question, well, bear with me. Um, Let's see, who is next here? Okay, let's try Suhail here. Question for Mark. I am in Canada on a post-grad work permit. My spouse is back in my home country. My points go down if I add him to my profile. Can I list him as not accompanying if he's here on a spouse open work permit? No, I never, ever advise people to list a spouse who's here on a spousal open work permit as not accompanying. I've seen IRCC allege misrepresentation in that regard. And in fairness, you, yeah, unless you have real solid proof that the person is leaving the country, going, like going back to study somewhere else or care for elderly parents or whatever the, uh, the reason might be, but they're actually not going to be here when you submit your application. That's the only time I'll consider filing it um, immediately before their departure. But I want clear evidence that they're actually leaving. So no, I would never, ever list them, no matter what the points are. Okay, uh, Football Total says, I applied for a work visa uh, to my wife. I got a letter from IRCC asking me to prove that I had a legitimate relationship for the, at least one year, but I've been dating for just eight months. What can I do? Well, the reality is if you're actually married, you don't have to prove that you have a, a, a relationship for one year. And this is something Football, where I recommend that you slide over to our firm website and book a consult because realistically, if you are married, then that marriage is the threshold that you have to establish. If you have alleged that you are common law, then they can point to the fact that your relationship may not be one year. But if you've been dating for just eight months and you have not gotten married, then your, your spouse is not, um, not eligible. So you can't apply for a work visa, but you've described her as a wife and I'm assuming that you guys are actually married. And if that's the case, then the officer is asking for stuff beyond what would be expected in the context of a marriage. Um, yeah. So if you, like I said, always, if you guys have questions, I recommend that you slide over here and you can click the link below is where you can get access to this and book a consult. All right. That is what I recommend that you do. Okay, let's keep zipping along. And I'm actually, one thing I like here is my new little system. So I'm going to raise myself up here so that I can stand as well as sit. 
And uh, okay, let's jump to the next question. Let's see what we got coming up here as I raise myself up. I'm gonna move my chair out of the way. Oh, that's better. I'm just not standing enough, you guys. I'm just not standing enough. Okay, let's keep this going up a little bit higher. There we go, that's pretty comfortable. Okay, let's see what's next here. Uh, next question, this one is, okay, this is from International Study Experiences. Okay, hi, I'm an early childhood teacher trained for Turkey with a master's in education from the Netherlands and now doing a master's in child studies in Montreal. Can I launch a peer application BCPNP? If you're already working and living in a different province, it becomes really difficult to convince another province that you will actually go there and move. Unless you are living there and actually working there, it's really, really difficult. But there's nothing stopping a person from submitting an application, but you just have to really justify that you intend to live there. All right. Okay, zipping along. Let's see. I don't think we have any other super chats. Uh, let's see. Who is next? Um, Juste says, is it possible to attend in the express entry course at another time, any time it's suitable for us? Well, the reality is the master classes, now that we're getting into warmer temperatures, I only do them from 4 to 5 p.m. Monday through Thursday. So 4 p.m. Mountain Time to 5 p.m. Mountain Time, which is 6 Eastern Time, and it's 3 to 4 um, uh, Pacific Time. So at any time, you can connect in, have access to all the, the, the master class material, join in, uh, um, well, I should say have access to all of the course material and then join in the master class and get your questions answered. Um, you'll also have an opportunity to attend another one at, you know, next month or at a later date alive if you want to attend live. But while the master classes are going on, people can easily post their questions in the group and then, excuse me, then I will answer them live during the master class. So, so as you stay, I highly recommend that you do that. Take advantage of it and jump on and join right now. And remember, you can watch them on demand after the master class is completed at your leisure at whatever time works for you. Okay, Joyful Journey. Okay, yes, I see what you're saying. So are PNP officers paid by the province? If yes, how would the PNP processing times be delayed as well considering this is a federal strike? Yes, you're 100% correct, yes. So I was thinking in the context of the, the, the second level of, um, of the application process with IRCC, but thank you for pointing that out. Joyful Journeys, yes, if they are provincially um, and they're not a part of the federal um, um, PSAC or whatever, whatever the, the union is, then yes, they wouldn't be negatively affected by that. Um, but remember, part one of the PNP is just the nomination. You still have to have express entry application if you're going through one of the express entry streams. And the regular PNP that doesn't go through express entry still has to be processed by IRCC officers the ones that are federal. So in the case of PNP applications, maybe the nomination will be delayed, but the entire application will absolutely be delayed if, an, um, uh, if the, the strike doesn't end soon. Okay. Okay, Kay says, hey Mark, I have a super chat question as well. It's all the way on the top. Kay, I do not see yours. Let me just see if I can find it. I have one from Kay. I don't see your super chat here, Kay. Let me go into YouTube and we'll see if we can find it over there. Let's see, I'll go into the master class and I'll stop that. Let's see if we can find Kay's super chat because I don't want to miss one if we have it. Let's see, I see Ali. Okay, you were right at the very beginning, that's why. Okay, well, let's adjust. Let's see if we can pull yours right on here this way. I'm just going to copy it, Kay. I think it was uh, it came on before we even started. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take Kay off of here, and then we're going to pull Kay onto here. Okay, so this is Kay's super chat. She says, renewed my passport recently, so I have a new passport number applying for a post-grad work permit extension soon. So should I opt in or apply separately? how to update the passport number. So this here, Kay, is something that you would actually need to book a consult with because right now we're experiencing a lot of, how do you describe it? The same reason you're asking this question. There's glitches all over the place with this opt-in process. Obviously, one of the things IRCC has consistently told us is if you have to change, your passport is not 
it isn't of the duration of 18, like long enough passport when you opt in. Like you can try to opt in, you can try to use your new passport number, you can try to do that. If you can, then go down that path. If not, and you run into glitches, which they're all over the place right now, and we've got a number of questions in through the CBA to try to get a resolution on these, these glitches that we're seeing when people are trying to opt in. But if you're not getting that confirmation of opt in, and I wonder if I have a copy of that here. Let's just see. I'm not sure if it is. Let's see. Let's see if we have this. Bear with me for a second. Hmm. I'm just trying to find the actual email that was sent out with a screenshot of what the opt-in should look like. Okay, I can't find it. So I was just looking at uh, some of my emails, see if I can locate it. Um, so, so basically, there's if you choose to um, just file, like to apply separately, and somehow you are, you know, I guess opted in in a way, um, there will be a way if you've got a duplicate application in the queue to get your fees back that you paid through IRCC. But when in doubt, I just apply. Okay, I just don't take any chances. All right. I think we've got Kay's question answered there. So that was a good question, Kay. Thank you. All right. Let's see who is next on our list here as we're cruising along. And I'm happy to chat about anything that you guys want to talk about. Express entry is really driving the ship these days. So the questions tend to be focused on that. But if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to post them now. I would love to hear from you. Okay, let's see what is next. We're zipping through here. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, here we go. Enzo. Okay, Enzo says, if someone is studying in a province and receives an ITA from another PNP, this person, so I'm assuming a notification of interest is maybe what you're talking about. Um, this person could continue his or her studies. What would change if this person is an open work permit holder due to spouse's study permit? Okay, this one, Enzo, is absolutely, I'm going to ring this little bell right here, which is book a consult because I need way more details. Ultimately, if you're in Quebec, for instance, and you're working or studying Quebec and you've got opportunities in other provinces, there are issues associated with that. There's issues if you're going through express entry and you live in Quebec. So there's a whole bunch of things and I can't answer, Enzo, your question um, without a whole lot more detail. So I strongly encourage that you book a consult. Okay, let's see what is next here. Okay, so receive it says in the citizenship application, they gave all the addresses except they made an error where one year period from the previous address is seen in the next address. Both addresses are in the same area. Could this create a problem? Well, yeah. Anytime you have anything that is not right in your application, it can cause you issues. So you do whatever you can to try to update the record as soon as you can through a web form or if you have any other mechanism um, in place to be able to... Um, like if you have a file number or something associated with it, but at the earliest opportunity, you correct it. Okay, Vicki, great to have you connecting in from Alberta. That's fantastic. Welcome, welcome. All right, let's see who's next. Um, Puria says, hey, Mark, I've been watching your lives for more than a year. Thank you very much. I'll give you some applause. I just recently submitted my peer application. Thank you for all your great content. You are very, very welcome, Puria. And I sure you submitted your peer application. I hope you're able to benefit from the course. I hope you subscribe to it. And uh, boy, I wish every single person that, uh, you know, that was able to do this. Um, okay, do I need to pay for express entry? And how can I know if the express entry is genuine? Okay, Emmanuel, I don't know what you're asking, really. The, the reality is... Um, like if you're applying through express entry through the government, well, it's it's pretty easy to see. Uh, if you have any questions, I, you know, you can book a consult and we can sort it out. But really, I'm not sure what you're asking. If you're asking about the course that I offer, the express entry course, yes, there is a fee for it. And genuine, well, I don't know. I guess you can listen to the hundreds of other people that 
you know, more recently have taken the course and I've got, you know, over a thousand that have taken it in the last, over the last couple of years. But um, I don't know what else to tell you. I'm an immigration lawyer and I created it. And uh, if you go to the links that are in the link below, it's, it's genuine. Okay. All right. Let's see what we have next. Um, okay. Thale says, what about the strike? Do you think the, th that can affect the next draw? Well, I don't think so. The draws are going to continue in a regular pattern. It's just the processing. Um, June says, I'm working from Korea. i am worked at the same company for 10 years overseas. For work history, can I write it under a single entry with the latest job title instead of multiple, enti uh, multiple entities? It comes down to the knock codes, okay? So if you are working in the same position for those entire 10 years, then that's one entry. And if it's the same knock code, it's one entry. But if you're working in multiple different positions, then I would always break those down, always. Now remember, once you hit three years of foreign work experience, it really doesn't give you any more CRS points. But if you need up to six years of foreign work experience to hit that 67 points out of 100 to be eligible under the Federal Skilled Worker Program, well, then maybe that's what you're shooting for. But yes, if you've got different positions and you've worked your way up, um, I always separate those out. I always do, June. Why? Because that's what it tells you to do. And if you were to just list the one position and say that you'd worked in that position for 10 years overseas, that would be 100% misrepresentation. So I'll leave that with you there. Sam, hey Sam, good to see you. He says, uh, hi Mark, waiting on my PNP application to be processed currently. Thanks for your assistance to help get this done. You are very, very welcome. My pleasure. It was absolutely my pleasure. Can't wait to hear the results. Okay, next is uh, Patricia. Patricia says, hello, Mark, I'm a PR and I would like to know more information about citizenship. Can you provide any guidance information? Well, it's pretty simple, really. It's a three and five rule. And when it comes to citizenship, once you've lived in Canada and you have uh, shown that you've uh, spent at least three years in a five-year period. Now, with that being said, they do give you half day credit for every day spent um, as a worker or uh, you know, in valid temporary status as, as a student or a worker in Canada. So you do get credit for half day credits for that. But, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's an online process now and um, the applications are online. You need to make sure that you can clearly document all the travel outside and that you've got the requisite number of days and years, three years in every five year period. And then uh, you may be eligible to apply. Now, we help our clients with this stuff all the time. And you guys, I think many of you probably are aware by now as you're tuning in that a healthy immigration law is the law firm that backs everything that we are doing. And if you have any questions, uh, you can see we have a, a, we work with clients all the time doing all kinds of different types of applications. You can join into our newsletter here, um, but it's all about direct lawyer to client collaboration. And uh, we work directly with you. And so you can actually hire us to, uh, yeah, to get um, uh, to get your application reviewed, like Peter here and and uh, Tin Flute here, <laughs> uh, for example. Those are just two that left reviews uh, 23 days ago. And why do I not have reviews more recently? Because I've got issues with Google um, delisting our business profile because I changed the address on it. So hopefully uh, from Lethbridge to Calgary, and hopefully <laughs> we can get that resolved. <laughs> so. There you have it. So there's a link in the description below here, uh, Patricia, for you to book a consult. Okay, let's see what's next. Um, <laughs> Mohammed, how long do you think this strike will be? Oh my goodness, I have no clue. No clue whatsoever. All right. Um, okay, Sukun says, I have the extended postgrad until next October. I also have an ITA. Can I apply for a TRV current work visa expiring next month? before or after submitting my PR application, or will that be dual intent? No, if you've got an ITA and you've got a postgrad work permit that has been extended until next October, well, you're gonna file your, your, your EAPR with that ITA, and then you're gonna apply for a bridging open work permit. Once again, Sakun, if you're in this situation trying to strategize, that's what we do within our law firm. We meet with our clients and we develop a plan and a strategy to make sure that you don't lose the ability to work while you're in Canada. And if, as you've laid out here, you have an ITA and you're getting ready to submit your EAPR, once you've got that submitted, you can apply for a bridging open work permit to extend your stay if you need to. So 
Uh, when it comes to TRVs to be able to leave and re-enter Canada, a temporary resident visa, that is, um, uh, that if you're looking at uh, applying for that, then I always like to make sure that I have a little bit of time on my temporary status document before I apply for the temporary resident visa. Otherwise, it's often restricted to the length of the work permit or the study permit that you have. But just to kind of give you a full overview, um, dual intent is always possible in the context of, of any temporary resident in Canada who's looking to apply for permanent residence. So it's rarely an issue. In fact, IRCC recently uh, released another announcement encouraging officers not to be jerks and to uh, allow people to apply for PR um, and get their temporary applications approved to be able to come and stay in Canada temporarily. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how all that plays out and see if the officers actually listen. Okay, Lil Young says, please, Mark, am I qualified to work in Canada as an undergraduate? There's so much more to that, my friend. Go to the IRCC website and, uh, and you can look and you can explore all of the different pathways for immigration. In terms of working in Canada, it really comes down to the needs of the employer. Now, most employers, if they want to hire someone from outside Canada, have to apply for a labor market impact assessment. And then when it comes to the, the actual position, um, what the requirements are for that position, whether or not they could find a Canadian or permanent resident to do the job. If none of those things apply, they can't find someone in Canada. Then if they've identified you, then you have the ability potentially to, you know, to, to come in and, uh, and apply for a work permit based on that LMIA. But as always, for all of you, the same bona fide assessment has to be done. So to assess whether or not they believe you'll return back home if they grant your work permit or your study permit, whatever it may be. All right. Okay, next here. We seems like the questions are continuing to pile in, which is great. We've got about 17 minutes left. I may shut this down right at 10.55 today just because I have a presentation that I'm going to be doing. I got to make sure that I'm not missing anything here. Just give me a second. I've got a whole bunch of... <laughs> things going, I have a consult right at 11, that's why. And then I'm doing a presentation on, um, on law office tech tips and processes uh, that starts at 11.30 Mountain Time and goes until 1. So I've got a lot going on here today. It's a busy day. Then what do I have after that? Then I have a PNP portal final submission for someone who got a nomination here in Alberta. Um, and we're excited about that. And then I have a consult after that between 3.30 and 4. Someone squeezed in there. And then I have my master class from 4 to 5 p.m. today. And uh, as I look at tomorrow, um, yeah, I've got another post onboarding call with another client for a visitor visa. And then I do my live stream with Alicia. And then I have a meeting with the CBA, the Can Canadian Bar Association. And then I have another consult and then the master class all over again. So no rest for the wicked, but there is lots of capacity for you guys to book consults and connect in with me. All right, let's get to a few more questions here. Um, okay, Yoon says, my FSW with AOR was submitted January 6, 2023, and not a single update from the beginning, not even biometrics. Could I demand GSMS notes to verify what's going on with my application? Well, you can always request them. You know, it's just a simple request. It's not a demand. You know, you make the request and they provide it. Um, ultimately, we are in April and they say six months processing. And so it's not unusual to not get any, any feedback. Um, you know, it all depends on the processing, your FSW. And there's often, you know, not a, a massive sense of urgency. If you look at the processing times, which we always tend to, to jump on, but let's take a look at them right now. And I know that processing times are all over the map because what they state here doesn't always equate to what you're going to be... Um, you know, how long your application is actually going to take. But if we look here and we go to economic immigration and then we go to federal skilled worker, which is yours right here, and then we get processing times, you can see here it's listed at 27 months. And so the fact that you're only a few months in is really not a big deal at all. And there's nothing stopping you from requesting those GCMS notes, but understand that really you're well within the, the stated processing times. And so it's just a matter of being patient and trying not to compare your situation to someone else. Okay, Ashraf says, hey, Mark, what's the difference between a statement of purpose and a letter of explanation and, and better when I apply to add both? <laughs> okay, often a statement of purpose is something you would include in, in, in like a, a PNP application, more often than not a study permit application. 
where you're explaining why you want to study. That's often where a statement of purpose comes in. Um, study plans, they call them that, the, the, that as well. Letters of explanation can be used for anything, even in the context of a, a study permit application. And in, just to remind everybody, because I think sometimes people forget, I've got so many things going on. Not only do we have the express entry course, but I also have a postgrad 18 month extension and a study permit course. And I love this study permit course. It has so much information that explains exactly that. The difference between letters of explanation, how to use them strategically, how to prepare a rock solid study plan or a statement of purpose. So all of those things play a huge role in, um, in significantly increasing your chances of getting that study permit approved. All right, so go check that out. Same format, all of the, the live videos and everything, um, the, so the on-demand content is all available to watch those videos whenever is convenient for you. Okay, um, Anoop says, while applying for PR, at which stage we receive the R10 completeness check? How much time does it take to get that completeness check? Asking this to get an idea on when to apply for a bridging open work permit. You can apply for your bridging open work permit the moment you get that automatic response back from IRCC. In fact, if you look at your acknowledgement of receipt, it specifically gives you instructions in that letter that says, you know, how to apply for your bridging open work permit. So um, if you're going through express entry, that's how, uh, you know, that's when it comes up. Um, I'm just looking here. If you're going through like a PNP through the regular stream and that's what you're applying through, then um, it just depends on the type of application. Sometimes it can take a couple months to get an acknowledgement of receipt uh, in the context of say a, a, a through the PR portal through one of the programs that are eligible for bridging open work permits. So it just varies. All right. Um, uh, okay, so Yash says, hey, Mark, can we add our time period during work visa in our citizenship eligibility period? You, Yes, there is an ability to do that. It, um, so there's an ability to claim um, up to two years of time in Canada towards one year of the citizenship eligibility period. So, you know, like I said, we help clients with citizenship applications all the time and we'd be happy to assist you as well, Yash. But ultimately, it, there is, if you meet the requirements... And you in the eligibility to 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 have it included, then yes, it may be possible. Okay, DV, hey, great to connect with you. Thank you. Said love the masterclass, super helpful. I was wondering if it would look strange if I apply to a province I've never been to when my travel history is only to another city or province. Well, travel history isn't as big of a deal if you're visiting Ontario and ultimately you decide to apply through British Columbia. Well, that's not as big of a deal if you were to actually live in Ontario and do all of your study, all of your work, and then apply to say Alberta, for instance, well, Alberta's going to question whether or not you legitimately want to live in Alberta, given all your ties to Ontario. So thanks for connecting in, DV. Appreciate that. And uh, yes, hopefully we'll see you tonight in the masterclass. Okay, uh, Sheikh says, uh, sir, what will be uh, of long old pending files? I think it will be delayed due to strike. Well, everything could potentially be delayed due to strike. Yes. Okay, DV follows up. Would it help to have a travel history to the province I'm applying for PR in? Well, ultimately, you want to meet the minimum requirements. So if you're applying and you meet the eligibility requirements, then it wouldn't hurt to stop in and say, yeah, I've been there and checked it out. Absolutely, that would be beneficial. Usman says, scores 478 and I have an uh, IT-related knock. Do I have any chance for MSW or YNP? That's, I get those questions more often than not, Usman. Anything is possible at this stage with express entry, those big, big draws, it dropped all the way down to 481. So close, but what is the OINP going to do? Who knows? Who knows? So just hang in there, Usman, hang in there. Okay, uh, Christian says, IRCC asked me for proof that my wife and I have been in, okay, yes, a, rom uh, a legitimate romantic relationship for at least 12 months. Can we prove with Facebook, WhatsApp? What do you recommend? I recommend you book a consult, Christian, because you say wife here, okay? You say wife. And if someone is married, right? They're legally and lawfully married in the country in which the wedding took place. And it's that is a, a wedding that is not a proxy wedding or something that's disqualified by IRCC, um, showing that you have been in a legitimate romantic relationship for 12 months is not a legal requirement. And I, as a lawyer, would challenge an officer on that. Now, with that being said, I would still provide all the evidence possible to show 
how your relationship evolved up to the point in which you got married and that everything was legitimate and genuine and all those other documents that I include in. And what do I include those in? It's in this. So if we scroll down here, yes, I have a spousal sponsorship course as well. And so I highly recommend that you connect in and, and subscribe to that. But, um, you know, the, the most important thing is, Christian, if you are saying your wife is just really a common law partner, then you have an obligation to prove it. So all of those things are going to show that, you know, from the date, the last 12 months that you've been in a committed relationship for that period and you've been living together. So that is how I would dress it. Okay, Kujit says, Minister Fraser mentioned in second half of 2022 that processing times will return to standard of six months. IRCC website shows period of time that are far beyond the standards. Where's the truth? I don't know. I don't know. Like, I seriously don't know where the truth is. I don't. Now, obviously, the minister can't predict with 100% certainty what the future is going to hold. He can't. But there's been a lot of times where he has said things would happen and he doesn't have control over everything. So sometimes things happen that, you know, he hopes that, you know, their expectation is that things will return back and he's trying to make people feel good. But I'll be honest, I'd rather see 27 months processing for an FSW than six. If the reality is the processing times are actually 12 months. So I'd rather them under promise and over deliver than the opposite, say it's six months and then have it take 12 months. So it's a catch 22. I know the minister is doing the best that he can. Um, you know, in his, in his situation, he's got a number of other, you know, people administering the programs that he doesn't have a lot of control over. But if you're not happy, continue to express your, you know, express your concerns. And if you're an individual who went through the process and uh, has, has now become a Canadian citizen, will you have the right to vote? And if you're unhappy with what has happened over the last few years, then you are fully entitled to express your opinion um, based on how you vote in elections. And, uh, you know, if the Conservative Party made a whole bunch of decisions that, you know, negatively affected your family and you, you, you know, you're really frustrated, then don't vote Conservative. If the Liberal government has made a lot of decisions that really harmed your family and, and negatively affected their immigration process, then don't vote Liberal, right? Like there's NDP, there's a whole bunch of parties. So, but, but don't just accept things at face value. Don't just listen to what the politicians say. Like, ugh, it doesn't matter what party it is. If you want to listen, look at the actions, look at the fruits of the labors, okay? That's how you decide. I bring this up because we're going to be facing an election and some of you may very well be citizens by that time. And, um, you know, and there's this perception that some parties are more pro-immigration than others. And they're, that's simply not true. You know, you look at the conservatives, they, they are the ones who established express entry, this fast track system. You look at the liberals, they've been very, very positive towards, um, you know, refugees and, and really done a lot on that front. The NDP have consistently wanted to go, you know, battle and fight for parents and grandparents <clears throat> and the ability for families to be reunified. <clears throat> Excuse me. So don't be deceived into think that immigration is some kind of a wedge issue because all the parties are pro-immigration. All right. Um, okay. Yes. Aisha says, hey, Mark, would the strike affect the processing of visitor visa applications uh, applied from outside Canada also? It depends. It depends on if those uh, people processing those applications are a part of the unions. And I don't know the full breakdown across all countries, especially with domestically hired people, if they're part of any kind of unions. <clears throat> okay. Alusen says, what address uh, should I indicate on my police clearance certificate, my current address in Canada, or my past address when I lived in the country? That one I can't answer to you, Alusen. Um, you know, ultimately it depends on what the, that particular country is looking for. Countries like Pakistan search by residence and other countries don't. So I can't, I can't answer that one for you. Um, um, yes, Olu. Okay, I think we're going to wrap it up here, guys. I know that we've got a bunch of other questions that have come through, and, uh, but I need to end so I can get ready for the next consult. But I want to express sincere appreciation for everybody that's tuned in all over uh, Facebook, YouTube. Um, I didn't see anyone on LinkedIn uh, or Twitter today, but thanks for joining in. We had another great live Q&A. Remember, we'll be back tomorrow once again. Also, I want to point out something that I always, always try to do every single episode is the fact that not only do we have all of these video content, but we also have our, our podcast. And uh, I strongly encourage you to connect in and listen into the podcast. Um, we have our, uh, the impossible Canadian trivia, this audio, I'm going to talk to Igor. I didn't like how that audio sounded during this, um, 
uh, this, this podcast episode, but definitely connect in and listen uh, to Alicia and my, you know, we've got our business immigration series that we're working through and there's a number of, uh, you know, uh, LMIA process. And so I check, so definitely check in and, uh, and tune in and subscribe to the podcast as well as the YouTube channel and all of the other uh, resources that we have available for all of you, including the immigration courses um, that right now our pillars are, of course, uh, Express Entry, which you can subscribe right now to any of these. Express Entry, um, post-grad 18-month uh, course, we have that one, study permit course, disposal sponsorship. Um, we have an LMIA course as well that is in the process of getting updated, but all of these are available for you to get additional help as well as connecting into our law firm. And it always starts by booking a consult, speak to a lawyer right here, and it is holthylaw.com, but just click on the link below. All right, guys, thanks so much for tuning in. We will see you again next time, which would be tomorrow at noon with Alicia.